Thank you. I think I don't have, uh, yeah. thank you so much, Christoph. I think, you, I think you did very well. You just kept the delay. You didn't increase it, so great. And thank you to all our, um, our panelists. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, what you said about the fight against, um, clearly about uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation, uh, from what we heard, we understand this is a very complex issue um, and that there are large gaps still in understanding the phenomena at stake. So it's obviously difficult to address um, those issues and more uh, research um, are needed. Uh, but on the other hand, we also heard a call for more holistic and more systemic uh, approach uh, to this issue. So thank you so much for, your, um, for, your, for this debate that uh, I think paves the way for further discussions. This is a very hard topic that I'm sure our friends in, in Gov, uh, in the Governance Directorate at the OECD will continue uh, look, looking into. So uh, without going to a coffee break, let's now move on to the next panel which to some extent, you know, is not unrelated, which is about countering undue influence in uh, democracies and reinforcing uh, integrity. This is our last panel uh, before lunch, but we'll try to um, make sure that you do have time for lunch and for interactions. We'll probably postpone a little bit the start of the afternoon sessions. Uh, not too much, though. Um, and so we will then move into smaller uh, breakout sessions in the afternoon. So one of the key messages of the trust survey is that um, is about expectations on governance, governance integrity. And, and we see that, that those have changed over time and that um, um, it's not, the results show that uh, are not as good as might have been expected. So this is really a, a critical issue uh, for trust uh, because integrity is of course uh, an inherent value of our democracies that ensure that governments respond to citizen needs and are not influenced by the interests of um, you know, particular interests or constituencies, and also, of course, um, by undue influence of um, um, foreign um, actors. So this is a very uh, key issue in, our, in, in uh, today's time, and I'm very pleased that we now uh, have a panel on this discussion, and I'm uh, happy to uh, ask the panelists and the moderator uh, to come to the uh, on stage and I'm going to hand over to uh, Giulio Basio who is the head of public sector integrity at the OECD to lead this uh, panel. I'm, I'm going to ask you to really keep to the time. So um, we have time for lunch afterwards. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the third plenary session on reinforcing integrity and countering and new influence in democracies. Uh, apologies for the delay. I think the, the interesting discussions have uh, uh, taken us uh, I think a half hour late, but don't worry. I think we can have an interesting discussion. We'll go a little bit into the lunch break, but then we will extend the lunch break and we will start a little bit later uh, the, in, the, in the afternoon sessions. Um, if you're here, uh, I think you will all agree that integrity is an inherent value of democracy that ensures that the government responds to the interests of the people. We also now know that integrity systems also help to strengthen the resilience of democracies to foreign interference by non-democracies. So the discussion today aims at unpacking some of the elements around these two issues of integrity, what it means, how we can strengthen it, what are the challenges that we're facing today, and how particularly the issues of undue influence are affecting democracies, and now with the added um, element, if I can say, of uh, foreign influence. Uh, for the discussion today, we have actually a, a, a very distinguished uh, uh, group of panelists. I will actually uh, not introduce them myself. I would like to ask them 
if in one minute or less, you can introduce yourself, but especially also say, why are you here? Why do you accept this invitation? Why is this issue important to you? Uh, and some of you are coming from very far. Maybe if you allow me, we, we go in this order. Delia, please. Delia Ferreira Rubio, I am the chair. I am Delia Ferreira Rubio, I am the chair of Transparency International, the more than 100 countries around the world, who I accept the, the very kind invitation, and I have had the pleasure to be working on undue influence and integrity with the OECD in many occasions. Why? Because integrity is key for democracy. It is key if we want to restore trust and also it is key if we want to uh, prevent and uh, tackle corruption and undue influence. Without integrity, it will be impossible. Thank you, Delia. Kristen. Hello, yes. Good morning. Um, my name is Kristen Sample, and I'm the Director of Governance at the National Democratic Institute, which is a non-governmental, non-profit, non-partisan organization that supports democratic processes and partners around the world. So why am I here? Well, um, you had me at democracy. <laughs> Just seeing the title and the concept of, of, this, of this conference I thought was so important. The OECD has a policy-focused mandate, and I'm very impressed that the OECD is not taking a technocratic approach to its mandate, but rather being very democracy-aware and democracy-intentional so that its um, policy and its programs are reinforcing democratic processes and institutions. So props to the OECD and to this process that you have underway. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Hannah Cameron. I'm from Wellington, New Zealand, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner at Takawa Mataho, the Public Service Commission. Um, I guess I'm here, in, in New Zealand we have our own um, public trust survey, and when we ask people why they trust, those that answer positively, um, they talk about responsiveness and reliability, but they also talk about the people that they interact with. And they talk about, they use words like um, respectful and honest. And I really feel that that's what integrity means to me. And I think this panel is critical to trust. It's about how our public service um, can deliver services and have those interactions in a way that citizens really believe that they ha we have their best interests at heart, um, which is obviously the underpinning of all of our institutions. Thank you. I'm Didier Migo, the president of the High Authority for the Transparency of Public Life in France. Why am I here? Because the topic um, fits into our missions. The question of integrity, honesty, as the president president of Transparency International said, are essential topics for our democracies. We can see the efforts that are being made to destabilize democracies and the honesty of public officials, uh, the integrity, uh, um, an essential concern of our citizens. And it is the case in France where the crisis of confidence is also very serious, so it's necessary to convince the citizens that there are institutions which are there to monitor the situation and to secure the necessary transparency. Thank you. Senator to the OECD, and uh, I was particularly interested in this invitation because this topic is just so foundational uh, to who we to who we are, certainly in the United States and in all of our like-minded countries. Uh, as you all know, we had a very important election. Uh, last week, and in advance of that election, uh, President Biden gave a very powerful speech, essentially focusing on the urgency of standing up for and fighting uh, for our democracy. And he said each, gener each generation has to defend, protect, and to preserve, and to choose it. Uh, for that's what democracy is, a choice of, by, and for the people. And that, was, that is as true today as it has ever been in our history. And I think all of the issues that are on the table uh, over these couple days uh, are just so important as we, uh, as we work against some of the other forces out there at the, at the moment. But uh, very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Natalia. 
Good morning. My name is Natalia Diaz. I'm Minister of the Presidency of Costa Rica. It's an honor for me to be here today. As many of you know, we are one of the 10 countries which has one of the most robust, solid, robust democracies in the world. But this does not mean that we do not face threats or challenges. So I think that we can all learn from each other. We can share best practices. And it's a real honor to be here today with you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for taking the time to uh, for being with us today. Um, Delia, if I can start uh, with you. I mean, in this round, what we'd like to cover is um, focus very much on the integrity of those that represent us. What are, uh, what are the issues? What are the challenges that we see today? Perhaps even compared um, uh, to the past and how we can finally achieve what we call political integrity, the integrity of the elected officials, of the appointed officials. So um, if you can tell us about why, why you think it's so essential and what are these challenges that you see and what can governments finally do? Okay, a long, long question for almost the panel, a complete <laughs> <laughs> conference, but uh, some results on the survey are very important in this, uh, in this uh, aspect because only 40% of the respondents says that public officials would refuse a bribe. And we are talking of very established, well-developed democracies. And the majority says that public servants uh, would accept a job in private sector in exchange of a favor. And this is really very, very uh, striking, not because it is new for uh, those of us who are working in anti-corruption, but really striking in this kind of survey in very solid or apparently robust democracies. Because what they are saying is that uh, elected officials are not seen as working for the public good, as you said at the beginning. And all the problems that are detail or pictured in the survey has to do with the big elephant in the room, which is money and politics. The very dangerous relation on money and politics. I am not just talking about political finance or campaign finance. I am talking about public procurement, conflicts of interest, uh, the revolving doors, and this is crucial for democracy. The questions that we are asking is, are the representatives representing us or representing those who financed their campaigns or their career as politician or are really ready to offer a private job in exchange of a favor? And a favor is not a favor, it's a public policy decision. We have to be very careful about that. So who are the representatives really representing? Second, are we really equal in democracy in the face of this dangerous relation of money and politics? I don't think that any ordinary citizen in many countries, and let's move to the global sphere, can uh, be sure of an answer from a politician a deputy or a senator, if he or she makes a call, vis-a-vis -vis a call from those financing the campaigns or giving money or being able to offer the job. Is democracy inclusive in this panorama? I have really my doubts. And it is not only efficiency. Efficiency is very important, as you, Minister, said. But it is also coherence and exemplarity. What we saw during COVID was not only public procurement uh, full of scandals on corruption, vis-a-vis -vis vaccines, ventilators, and all that. We also see public officials, elected officials acting without any exemplarity, acting without integrity, not complying with the rules that they have, they themselves had imposed on the rest of the citizens. We see the party gates 
uh, scandals, not only in one country, around the world. We saw the vaccine gates with the VIP, VIP vaccination in many countries with different kind of privilege. So that is what we are talking about. And when we talk about integrity, we are talking about the quality of public policies. Are policies oriented to public good or are policies the response and the um, payment of favors already received? That's what we are talking about. What we need, we need more information, more integrity, less impunity, so the, the, the idea of consequences for corrupt behavior is not strong enough, less impunity and less indifference, less tolerance on the part of the citizens. Don't abandon, abandon the fight. We have to keep on asking and pressing for integrity. Thank you very much, Adeli. I think you are very much outlining at a global scale the challenges uh, that many countries face and also the, what is feeding this discontent in certain places, the discontent with democracy. Um, if I can turn to you, Minister uh, Diaz, um, Costa Rica is la democracia uh, más antigua. Is the most, the oldest democracy in Latin America. How has political integrity helped Costa Rica um, keep its democracy, and where are the challenges? Thank you very much for your uh, question. In fact, since the Constitution in 1949, our democratic system has been underpinned for several reasons, one of them being civic education which back then was very different from today's civic education, as well as uh, social solidarity that um, ruled back then. Back, back in the day, there was social mobility, true social mobility, and people had a chance to uh, improve, regardless of where they were born. And this has been lost. We have it somehow, but not as it used to be, and this is one of the greatest challenges that we are facing nowadays. And there is a weakening of the middle class here in Costa Rica. Uh, middle class has been weakening over the years, and this is one of the reasons why integrity has underpinned democracy. And we, these are important elements that mm, help us see our, our country as a full democracy. Our, in our constitution, um, enshrines the existence of the elections supreme court, or that is an independent body that has a lot of credibility both locally and internationally. Then there is also the coalition of the military that since 1949 doesn't exist, but um, this has enabled us to uh, allocate these funds to um, the society. And as I said before, this means that we are currently facing uh, threats to our democracy. There is a lack of opportunities, of equal opportunities for the population. They do exist, but we have lots of challenges ahead. And I would like to highlight several aspects that I deem important. The first has to do with what I said at the very beginning, education. Civic education, which is the um, education of the citizens, that uh, they, they need to understand that they will be making decisions for the countries, that they will be participating in po political um, processes. We need them to be motivated to um, help the country grow. We need to keep teaching values, and we need to keep teaching them from, from the from uh, from the homes, from the from the families, we need uh, the population, the citizens, to be, be engaged and to have information available to make um, decisions, informed decisions. It's true that um, part of the population speaks English, but we also need to encourage education. Uh, 
in international education. This is one of our challenges. We also need to improve responsibility and accountability. And we need to have citizens participate throughout the decision-making process. This is a huge challenge, challenge. We are a democracy, but we need to have more representation. Next, uh, as for political integrity, we have a huge challenge. We need to see how we will institutionalize um, a coordination organ or body. We need to engage all agencies. The government has been working on this. They have been fighting corruption, and they want to uh, rule out excessive proceedings when it comes to starting um, businesses or startups. Nowadays, it's very difficult for entrepreneurs to start projects. So we want uh, to do rule out te red tape, because this red tape has favored lots of public officers, and this is the reason why we are fighting this um, battle. And last, we need to strengthen the those um, bodies in charge of investigating corruption, and also those in charge of international crimes. I would say quite a long list of, of, of actions that could be taken. Uh, maybe allow me just to highlight two. Perhaps one is the issue of values that we had discussed even earlier, which was uh, values that um, they are still in society, but perhaps we, we could do more, especially coming from the government, reestablishing within schools and curriculums uh, civic education systems or social solidarity, as it, they existed in many countries in the past. And as you said, more representation and better representation. Um, if we move now to uh, Monsieur Migo, uh, la uh, haute autorité a pris une décennie d'expérience dans la promotion de la transparence. After a decade of experience in promoting transparency, Mr. Migo, what are the challenges you still have to take up um, in strengthening the standards of integrity and what are the necessary tools for that? Well. We set up a number of tools in France with that end in view. And the High Authority for the Transparency of Public Life is one of those tools. The authority I preside over is an authority which is totally independent from public authorities. And it makes collective decisions, consensus-based decisions. So independent and collective collective decisions. I, I think it's very important to mark the distance uh, with, or as regards public authorities, and to be able to rely on a group of people, uh, very diverse people with different perspectives. And it's the case of the high authority in France. There are members of the Council of State, there are members of the Supreme Court, of the Court of Auditors, uh, in addition to a number of people who are representative of different sectors. We have tools such as the property statements or declarations that enable us to understand whether or not public officials have enriched themselves in an undue way. Um, we have the public interest um, declaration in our country, an essential tool to prevent conflicts of interest. And beyond the declaration of interests and its chapters, this declaration of interests should be the opportunity for public officials to think over everything that would be likely to generate conflicts of interest uh, for themselves um, in relation with their past or in relation with the situation of their spouse or um, partner or their, f their relatives, or even friends. Conflicts of interest that could arise from their relationships with their friends or relatives or spouse. So on the basis of that declaration of interest, we strive to prevent um, conflicts of interest and support public officials. So they avoid um, conflictive situations. So the prevention of the conflicts of interest is um, 
crucial for us, it's paramount for us. Of course, there is also transparency, which is essential. Publicity, publication, which can vary according to the status of the person, the quality of a person, um, vary according to whether that person is an elected official or not. But um, monitoring control is not enough. Transparency is also essential because transparency um, means being under the scrutiny of citizens and the media. And that scrutiny may lead to pointing the finger. If we get um, what we consider fact-based information, it can lead us to reopen certain cases that may, might have been previously closed. And another aspect that is essential without which we cannot hope to gain to the total trust of the citizens is punishment, sanctions. If there has been an acceptable, there have been an acceptable behaviors, if there is no sanction or if the sanction um, is imposed too late, well, this generates distrust among the citizens. The citizens, when they um, breach and breach of the law, um, they are immediately sanctioned um, by a fine or another um, sanction. And public officials should be submitted to the same sanction. In a short time, in a short time span just like any ordinary citizen. So this is the framework. We make proposals to public authorities to strengthen here and there, to increase the number of people who should make those property declarations and those declarations of interest. We also try to strengthen our rights to communication. It's necessary if we want really to carry out proper inspections and the right of sanctions, uh, of applying sanctions, which, as I said, is essential. It remains a challenge in many places, and uh, we were discussing also er uh, earlier um, um, about the challenge that sometimes the systems are there and prevention is there, but then the last part or the other side of the coin um, is still uh, pending or missing. And uh, something else that uh, Mr. Migo has mentioned, which is that the control is not enough. And I'm very happy to hear that because a lot of the work that we do at the OECD goes much beyond just the control. And you provided some of the, what I would say, keys for success. Uh, of course, transparency, but, but even other aspects of the independence, collegiality, and providing the tools uh, to support the public officials to, to take the right decision. Um, if I can turn now to you, Ambassador Markel, um, what has been the United States' approach to strengthening political integrity, especially in the context of the new anti-corruption strategy that was adopted uh, uh, in December, so it's fairly recent, which actually applies both this strategy, both at home but also abroad. So we start uh, this conversation uh, with the view that the strength of any democracy is dependent upon the belief, the trust that people have uh, that their voice can actually matter, that their voice does matter on issues that affect uh, their lives. And I think about what my uh, colleague here from Costa Rica uh, said in her comments about the threats that are posed to many of the middle class, uh, members of the middle class in our, in our countries, uh, as they believe they have fewer opportunities to, uh, to, to advance. Mm -hmm. She's right, and there are many reasons for that. But one of the ones that we cannot ignore is the fact that political corruption itself uh, can rob citizens of access to important services, now, whether it's health care or public safety, education, the like. It harms the business environment, it decreases economic opportunity, it exacerbates inequality. And so given all of these downsides, the Biden administration, uh, as Julio mentioned, uh, created the first ever U.S. strategy on countering corruption, which does set out a plan uh, to organize the fight against corruption both in the U.S. and abroad. In the U.S., it means addressing some of the gaps uh, in our anti-money anti laundering uh, regime, like collecting information on shell companies, uh, as well as, for that matter, on real estate, so that ill-gotten gains are not parked into investment properties, which, of course, can distort our housing markets. 
Uh, it means taking a hard look how, at how digital assets uh, may be used to further corruption. Uh, we're holding corrupt account, uh, actors accountable uh, by prosecuting, prosecuting them, uh, by uh, freezing assets, by recovering assets, uh, and then returning the assets uh, to those people who were harmed by the corruption uh, in the first place. Uh, internationally, uh, we're working to strengthen uh, multilateral anti-corruption infrastructure at places like the OECD, as well as the UN and the Organization uh, of American States as well. We also recognize uh, that private sector actors have a very important role to play here, not just governments, uh, as it relates to fighting corruption. Civil society is really important, uh, as is investigative uh, journalism. Now, this is really quite core to our history uh, with the focus on a free press, which I can tell you can sometimes be uncomfortable for those in power, but incredibly important. And so Thomas Jefferson, when he was, you know, the, our third president said if he had to choose between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, he would without any hesitation choose newspapers without a government uh, because he believed that the role of the press is so, uh, in, in terms of keeping government power in check, uh, is so fundamental to a healthy society. We hope that's not a choice we have to make, but that is where, uh, he, that, that's where he came out on it. So to this end, we're thinking even differently about some of our foreign assistance funding, in addition to the traditional uh, humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, we're also expanding and leveraging public-private partnerships uh, to root out corruption, to enhance information uh, sharing, and to promote uh, best practices as well. Thank you very much, Ambassador. If I can add to or, or complement to what you just said about the strategy and, and share here with the audience, we actually recently analyzed uh, the U.S. anti-corruption strategy through the OECD public integrity indicators, and we actually found that the scope of coverage is among the widest and deepest in the world, and actually, perhaps, the, the anti-corruption strategy that connects the most to the issues of democracy that we are discussing today. So that including issues of what you just outlined, media, um, uh, freedom, of, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, financial integrity, et cetera, et cetera. So what I invite you to, to look at, at, at this strategy, which is very, very connected to uh, many of the elements uh, that we, have, we will be discussing throughout the day today. Um, uh, Hannah, uh, if we move now to uh, in New Zealand, so as we have discussed, uh, elected and appointed officials need to uphold public integrity standards. This is what we've uh, mentioned. Yet, the integrity of public servants of the civil service is, of course, inherently connected to democracy. How can then we ensure that these standards uh, of integrity are upheld by public servants? And how can such standards contribute to an effective working relationship between the civil service and the political leaders? Um, so th the name of my organization I mentioned before is Te Kao Matahu, the Public Service Commission. Te Kao Matahu, that's not a direct translation. It comes from Maori tradition, and it conjures the place where people stand and being an authority for preserving kawa, which are um, broadly protocols, procedures, the frameworks that guide and support us. And when we were presented with that name, Maori leaders um, talked to us about a flock of birds and how a leader in a flock might fly sometimes at the front, sometimes on the wing, sometimes at the rear, to keep the flock in formation. And I think that's the concept that we bring to the um, concept of how we preserve integrity. Uh, we see it as first and foremost about people and about culture, about flying in formation. And, a shared understanding about what's important. And we talk a lot in New Zealand about the concept of the spirit of service that public servants bring to their roles. People choose careers in public service because they want to serve their communities. And we firmly believe that if we put this at the center of interactions with citizens, um, then that will in itself bring the integrity and the, the principles that citizens are seeking. So um, government organizations don't need to somehow inject some kind of values into those people or to ensure that they comply with rules and regulations. 
um, we, we flip that on its head and say, well, it's more about that those leaders have a duty to um, preserve and nurture that intrinsic motivation and to protect the power of public service and of government. And in our recent reforms in New Zealand, we actually made that explicit in our legislation. There is a duty on leaders to preserve, protect, and nurture the spirit of service that people bring to their role. And we also included in our legislation other fundamental um, principles that had existed in convention, things like political neutrality and free and frank advice. And these are the principles that really ensure that the public service provides that best possible advice and that once decisions have been made, that they implement them to the best of their abilities. And in our legislation, uh, the chief executives, the secretaries within our agencies are responsible for preserving those principles. And they're responsible to that, not to the government of the day, but to the apolitical public service commissioner. And we did this not because we thought our public service was broken. Um, in fact, we have very high levels of trust and, and, and well-flourishing democracy in many ways, but because, as many people have already said today, you can't take these things for granted. And we were very um, cautious to, not, to ensure that these principles are not eroded into the future. And we think that by putting these things in legislation, it increases a confidence of public servants and of ministers and elected officials. It creates a common understanding about the parameters of how those relationships should be conducted. And we believe that that will enable them to fly in formation and to get on with the important work that they have to do to tackle complex problems and to govern nations. Thank you, Hannah, for, for this. And also, if you allow us, we may borrow from you the flock of birds. Uh, I think it's very nice uh, to explain a lot of the work that we do and what we mean uh, when we're talking about pol public integrity. And one aspect that you're highlighting that I, um, that I like to highlight from what you said is this issue of intrinsic motivation in public service. Many times we forget that most people that join public service and are um, serving the public today have this intrinsic motivation. So it's about nurturing, and this is also connected to public integrity. Um, so to finish this first uh, round, uh, Kristen, if we can, uh, perhaps with you, I'd like to focus on a particular actor, which is the one that aggregates interests um, in when we're talking about representative democracies, and these are political parties. Uh, which are, of course, essential for integrity, but they are often overlooked when we speak about core integrity actors. Uh, what role do you think political parties can play in promoting integrity, and what can governments do to support better political parties in strengthening integrity? Right. Thanks so much, uh, Julio, for that question. Um, I want to start out by saying that this is not a new problem. It's a very old problem. It's a problem with no easy answers. And people like Delia precisely have been looking at this and exploring it and kind of ringing the alarm bell in terms of the challenges and the dangers of political finance corruption for many years. Um, so your question, do political parties have a role to play? They absolutely do. I think for too long, parties have been seen as the problem rather than part of the solution. I think it's really important to flip that script and look for ways that parties can, again, do more when it comes to political finance integrity. Along those lines, I was asked to speak specifically on, NDI has a program called Win With Integrity that focuses on those political parties who want to go above and beyond the legislation, who want to show that they are um, actors with integrity, who want to clean their own house as well so that they're not vulnerable to different forms of corruption and, um, and um, misuse. So again, political parties don't need to wait for legislation. There are internal practices that they can use to foster honorable uh, approaches and relationships. So we've developed this ladder approach that has basically three dimensions. First of all, it's getting your own house in order through um, accurate record keeping, having the internal systems uh, in place to be able to do the record keeping and the bookkeeping, and um, again, to have a good sense of where the money's coming from and how it's being uh, spent. 
The second aspect is committing to transparency, not just having those sort of internal uh, systems and controls, but also to be very uh, forthright in terms of sharing and disclosing, again, where your money's coming from and how it's being spent. And then third is setting some standards. Maybe this is the hardest part, but for parties to be able to say, these are the lines that we won't cross, and these are the types of donors that we're not going to take money from. Um, and just to give a, a specific example, um, you know, taken actually from the U.S., where there were candidates in the 2020 primary uh, elections that weren't satisfied or they thought they needed to go farther than what the regulations required. So if you look at these two candidates from the Democratic primary, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, for instance, again, not satisfied with the, the state of play of political finance integrity in the U.S., they committed to no closed door fundraisers to solicit high dollar contributions, no money from corporate PACs or from super PACs or fossil fuel drug or insurance companies, and then built a campaign that really relied on small donations. And Bernie Sanders has kind of famously broke all sorts of records for fundraising. In fact, I think it was 46 million in one month, where the average donation was $21. So I think there are ways, again, that political parties can show that they're going to go above and beyond. Of course, the Objective has to be more of a system-wide approach. So one last example I'll give is work that NDI did with Transparencia por Colombia, um, the TI chapter in Colombia, in a program called Cuentas Claras, where they started working with a few parties that wanted to, again, be transparent in terms of disclosing their, their finances. So they started with that sort of party-specific approach. But then it was adopted by the Election Commission as a system-wide sort of software and standardization process that now all parties and candidates have to comply with um, to disclose how they're spending their money and where their money is coming from. So again, parties don't have to wait. They can take the initiative. But hopefully, that will create some healthy competition, some peer pressure. And, and the government, the Election Commissions, the legislatures can then standardize that across the system. Thank you very much, Kristen, um, for uh, outlining this. The political parties as part of the solution, not, not, not only the problem. Um, and some of the elements on how to go about strengthening the integrity and the governance uh, of political parties as key actors when we talk about democracy. Um, if we move now to a, the second and final round uh, uh, of questions, uh, in this round, um, I suggest we focus on a particular issue, which is the issue of uh, um, influence or undue uh, influence uh, in democracies. First, I must stress that lobbying and influencing government is something that is actually essential, an essential element of democracy. So we are never uh, uh, um, referring to how to restrict this. On the contrary, what we want is more of, more of the good influence of the right uh, ways of lobbying and influencing government. But of course, as we all know, there are risks to this. So in this, in this round, we would like to, to discuss the impact of undue influence uh, and what, what, what impact can that have actually on, on democratic values or democratic processes. So if I start with you, Minister uh, Diaz, la estrategia nacional... The National Strategy for Integrity and Prevention of Corruption in Costa Rica includes the design and implementation of different measures in order to enforce transparency and integrity whenever some political decision is taken. Which is their strategy in order to tackle their risks, their concerns related to influence in the close future? We took mandate in May this year, and we learned that this strategy existed. It had been led at the time by the Procurer of Public Ethics together with an organization called Costa Rica Integra, which is national transparency in Costa Rica. They have been working in a working group, multi-stakeholder, which includes the judiciary, executive pro, uh, power, private sector, academy, different experts, and different stakeholders, which can be invited depending on the topics. Last month of July, a report on integrity on OC DC was presented in our country, and the president of the republic, Mr. Rodrigo Chavez Robles, was present there. And he insisted in his engagement to comply with this national strategy. In the government, we have launched a table 
which have been working for different months, and we have ordered them to coordinate with the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Presidency, just for this, to reinforce and foster all these reforms which are already in place. One of these reforms was presented on the 3rd of November at Congress, and it's the reform of law for protecting whistleblowers. And there shouldn't be any retaliation for those who report some corruption acts. We are working on that right now. We are also working in all the kind of reforms such as anti-corruption, anti-bribery, and different similar terms. And we are following ODC recommendations. And this is what we are doing right now in order to foster all these acts. There are many things still pending which also belong to this integrity approach, for instance, to reinforce transparency in decision policy making. We also want to create different frameworks, including integrity and transparency for those who work as counselors for the government. And we are also working on the legal framework for advocacy, conflict of interest, and these kind of topics. We are working firmly on this table, this dialogue, and we are trying to make this something institutional because today it's just something of public interest, but we have a decree which includes this table. So we are just trying to find an act or to create some regulation to find another scheme because we want this table and this dialogue to keep working. The ODC talks about a technical secretariat for leading the process. And we need to work with the Ethic Procurement Office, and we will keep working in fostering all these reforms. Another important topic we have tackled recently is that this multi-stakeholder table should also include decentralized institutions, for instance, local governments. And it could even include the Congress. It could be the presidency of the Congress, or it could be the presidency of different committees, for instance, the one linked to safety or drug trafficking or corruption. So also the legislative power can participate in this table and all together can be able to implement the reforms. It's necessary to link different powers, because we understand on one hand they have to be separated, but at the same time they have to work all together. It's the only way to foster these reforms. Sometimes there is no communication between different powers, and there is no coordination. And sometimes problems are common. So we maybe try to change the law in order to do something linked to legal issues. Or sometimes we need to talk to the administration in order to help with administrative management. But whatever it is, we have to talk once to the others, because otherwise there is no way to be able to achieve change. So I want to insist here on our commitment, the commitment of the presidency of the Republic. The president himself told me to say this here today. We are really engaged and committed with this agenda. It's really necessary to do it, because otherwise we will lose something which is very important for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, and uh, for um, sharing with us one of the perhaps uh, also overlooked issues, which is how do we institutionalize uh, um, integrity in terms of what are the institutions and the importance of institutions if we are talking about uh, democracy. Um, Ambassador Markel, the, the United States has one of the longest experiences addressing the risk of undue influence. So I'm sh you can share with us about specific tools that the United States has and has used in the past, whether this is domestic or foreign. Um, how have the existing, these tools like the Lobbying Disclosure Act or the Foreign Agents Regist Registration Act have provided more transparency on, on who's attempting to influence government. And as we look towards the growing challenge of foreign interference, and the United States is one of the few countries that has actually a tool in place to uh, provide some level of transparency on this, how can, do you think, how can the OECD support other governments in strengthening their resilience to this type of foreign threats? So the real question is who actually gets to influence a government? And the, the presence of undue influence threatens the principle that every voice matters, 
uh, because it reduces the ability of ordinary people uh, to be heard. Uh, before I was ambassador, I served eight years as the uh, governor of the state of uh, uh, Delaware. And I, I really saw firsthand how important individual voices uh, can be on a whole variety of topics, but especially when it came to young people as it related to the environment. And we got a number of uh, important environmental reforms through the kinds of reforms that had, they'd been working on in our state for literally three decades. But when a bunch of middle school kids and high school kids decided to build a coalition to make their voices heard, there was no choice but for the elected representatives, the House and the Senate, uh, to respond. And sometimes it can be very painful as an elected official to have to have these conversations uh, with your constituents. Sometimes you'd rather not have them, but at the end of the day, uh, we are all much better off uh, for it. And so the flip side of that, uh, the flip side of, ha of having every voice matter is the, is the undue influence, whether it's from internal sources like lobbyists or external sources like malign uh, foreign actors. Uh, either way, they're problematic uh, because they erode, they erode the basic trust that ordinary citizens uh, have that their, their voice is being heard. So, as I mentioned when I was governor, I saw that lobbying can play a huge role in how laws are made and how our government is conducted, at least in, in the U.S. Uh, and this lobbying can serve as the, whether it's an individual voice or a collective voice of important constituencies, or it could be the voice of a foreign power that's trying to disguise their voice uh, in an attempt to influence and to corrupt our political discourse uh, and our system. So we had a member of our Supreme Court a century ago, uh, Justice Brandeis. And what he said was sunlight is the best disinfectant. And that, which means that transparency is the best method to fight against undue influence. Uh, that was true then. Uh, we believe it continues to be true today. And so with that in mind, the U.S. passed uh, what Julio referred to, uh, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which shines a light on lobbying efforts so the public knows who is benefiting uh, from the lobbying. And what it does is it requires the registration of foreign commercial entities who are lobbying for the benefit of a foreign power, and it requires the reporting of detail, detailed information about their activities. And then that information is posted online, and it's available for journalists, it's available for researchers, it's available for citizens. We think that's really important, and it's been a, pun a powerful tool uh, to punish bad actors who seek to influence our political system and to disguise the beneficiaries uh, of their lobbying because failure to follow the rules can lead to prosecution uh, and it can lead to jail time uh, if they are convicted. Uh, sometimes those who are guilty of these violations uh, are also involved in illegal campaign donations, tax evasion, uh, and money laundering. Uh, money laundering. And often they are for autocrats or kleptocrats or just others who threaten our uh, rule of law system. So to help governments in, the, in this area, the OECD uh, can do what the OECD does best, which is to help uh, governments collect and use the data, uh, make the, uh, the data available widely uh, to inform citizens and policymakers. Uh, and so we also believe that the more countries that uh, pass their own fara like laws will, will facilitate uh, more and better information sharing amongst all of us and, and, str and strengthen us. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, um, for what you've mentioned on this principle of that every voice matters and perhaps every even more so young voices and the example you shared. And, I'll, and you also share the example of, of the, what we call the FARA, which is the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which I would encourage all of you to, to look at it because there's a lot of criticisms about registries in general when we're talking about transparency. But the, while it's true there are challenges about them, this is one example of how useful it is, and I would encourage you to look at it, and I'm sure you will find a lot of very, very interesting information. We have used it a lot at the OECD in the past. Um, moving on to Monsieur Migo. Um, Examinons une zone de risque spécifique d'influence undue, s'il vous plaît. Uh, reinforcing integrity and countering undue influence and democracies. How do you 
uh, ecology uh, links uh, between the government and citizens in France, what you call revolving doors, and what do you do to guarantee uh, compliance? And uh, more widely about the uh, uh, foreign influence in uh, France, so what are the tools you use to uh, counter that? The question which is raised, who influences the decision-making process, is a key question. So we should uh, uh, look at the tools allowing us to uh, uh, keep a track record of those who try to uh, influence. So it is uh, legitimate to defend one's interest, but it has to be done in transparency, and it has to be regulated. So there are several tools uh, that France has tried to uh, implement. So some uh, deserve some improvement. But there is what we call the mobility control, the control de mobilité, uh, from the public to the private and vice versa, from the private to the public. So uh, and there may be some uh, 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 strategies uh, uh, set by subgroups uh, in order to influence public authorities, public powers, for example, to be present in uh, ministerial cabinets. This is why it's very important to control those. There are procedures that have been implemented in France that are part of the uh, assignments, the remits of the high authority there have to express an opinion about the pre-designation of private people who, uh, people who come from the private sector to uh, uh, fulfill functions for a uh, ministry or at a uh, high level of the government. And the declaration, the statement of interest is a very important to in order to prevent uh, undue influence. As to the lobbying, in 2016, uh, uh, an act was passed in France that defines what the representation of interest is, and that tries to that aims at regulating the lobbying action through, among others, the keeping of a registry of the representatives of the uh, uh, interest kept by the IO Authority for Transparency in Public Life. We have 2,500 representatives of interest who declare uh, 55,000 actions, and this is uh, recorded in a transparent registry uh, kept and updated by the High Authority for Transparency in Public Life. So uh, it is far from being perfect, and uh, it we are indeed uh, uh, relying on uh, the experiences of other countries in the United States, Australia, Canada, and the European Union too, uh, Ireland uh, also, that have uh, um, created the same kind of registry. So with the obligation to be uh, registered in the registry to get in touch uh, to, uh, with a representative of a public authority. So in France, we have made it somehow a bit more complicated than necessary. So, so that uh, existing registry may not be as relevant as uh, wished by the legislators when the, they um, uh, drew up that uh, piece of legislation. Because there is a tendency in the administration to to, to uh, overlook what the legislators have uh, aimed at. So it's uh, very important to be clear about this and to uh, um, uh, address this. And then uh, uh, that's something we'd like to cooperate with, with the OECD, and it has to do with the influence of uh, other countries. And it's may um, uh, take different forms, and it may be very difficult to identify and to uh, uh, keep a record of this. And it is not easy because opacity is uh, more the rule than uh, anything else. Uh, these people uh, uh, indeed uh, use uh, uh, hidden channels or different uh, structures. It's important to be able to identify them and uh, to uh, keep track of all this. And once again, Transparency is probably uh, the best tool to um, 
understand the uh, influence exerted and how a public decision can be made. I would yeah, rephrase what you just said or repeat what you just said, which is the transparency of influence and highlight the, the um, I'm, I'm going to just translate into English, although it's not perfect, I think, but it's, I like it, which is the control of mobility uh, between the private sector and the public sector, which is something actually that it's, uh, we actually want more of that under this um, sunlight uh, that was mentioned earlier. Um, and there are, of course, imperfections, but I would also encourage you to to follow the work of the uh, high authority because it is quite advanced um, in the transparency, in this control of mobility, and um, many times we, we get requests from OECD countries or non-OECD countries about, for example, how do we control this mobility, and we actually point to the uh, experience of the high authority that uh, I think is quite insightful for many countries. Um, now, moving to Kristen. Um, since we were uh, talking also about foreign influence, one of the principal characteristics of foreign influence is this opacity, this mm -hmm. actually lack of transparency. But what type of transparency measures would you recommend as an effective counterpoint to this covert uh, foreign-sponsored influence, and in particular foreign political finance and foreign-sponsored information operations? Thanks, Julio, uh, for that question. So this is an issue that we've been looking at for, for a while now, and we've done some research with uh, Transparency International and with the Open Government Partnership, OGP, where we've looked at three forms of foreign-sponsored corruption, opaque debt, covert political finance, and information manipulation. So not, first of all, not surprisingly, they're all interrelated, right? These are um, forms of foreign-sponsored corruption that often work in cahoots, um, where an autocratic government can use information manipulation to tilt another country's election to favor the candidate that's going to promote their interest, or can use information manipulation, for instance, to promote a corrupt loan or extractive deal. So while these tactics and the relationships vary, um, as others have said, um, the through line is opacity. Um, foreign sponsored schemes, because they're aimed at subverting a country's democratic process and policy making, they're unpopular and they're often illegal. So knowing this, the autocratic actors take great care to shield their activities from from public scrutiny, from parliamentary scrutiny, by using um, confidentiality clauses or shell companies or proxy donors. Um, as others have said as well, and I agree, um, transparency is its a gateway reform. It's sort of the best initial defense against this form of undue influence. It helps to remove that shield or that cloak. And in the policy briefs that we've produced, we have kind of a menu of transparency options for each of those three forms of foreign-sponsored corruption. Since we've already heard this morning about information manipulation, and I already talked a little bit about political finance corruption, I'm gonna use my soapbox here to evangelize a little bit on the topic of debt transparency, actually, because opaque debt is a problem. It's more a feature than a bug in the system. Loans are often given without parliamentary scrutiny, without public information, without the existence of a loan being disclosed at all. And um, for instance, the World Bank said 40% of low-income developing countries have neglected to publish any sovereign debt data um, over the last two years. And what, what situation are we in? We're in a situation right now of acute debt distress around the world that um, fundamentally affects the development uh, trajectories of countries. As I'm sure a lot of you know, the poorest countries in the world, 21 of 25 countries in the world, currently are paying more in debt service payments than in healthcare, education and social services combined. So we're in this situation where irresponsible, unsustainable debt, in large part because it's been opaque and not subject to scrutiny, has contributed to a debt crisis that's now undermining our COVID recovery around the world, not to mention the integrity challenges. Of course, we have cases like Mozambique, where $2 billion of de uh, of debt were taken out in secret. We have other cases where official lending from, from China in particular just standardizes confidentiality clauses. It can't be disclosed to other uh, lenders or to the public, and it also often involves the uh, collateralization of strategic reserves. If the country doesn't pay it back, it can lose a port or an airport or some other strategic asset. 
So I think I'm also mentioning this because this is a solvable problem. <laughs> a lot of these democracy challenges we're talking about are really intractable, whereas I think this one has a much more simple um, solution, that if you're a borrower country, you need minimally to publish what you borrow. And if you're a lender uh, country or a, a bank or an IFI, you need to publish what you're lending. And that needs to be established, I think, and, and applied consistently as a global integrity and democracy norm. And I want to give a shout out, the OECD does have a debt transparency platform that seems perfectly functional. The problem has been a lack of political will in its application and in um, banks disclosing through that debt transparency platform. Again, the solutions are there, but I think it's up to um, OECD countries, uh, other borrower and lender countries, the IFIs and the banks to, again, um, consistently apply this norm um, to help, again, build resilience against um, corruption through um, opaque lending and foreign influence through opaque lending. Thank you, Kirsten. So you have the three ways, I would say, is the information manipulation, political finance from abroad, and uh, not, not new, but perhaps highlighting it more, the opaque debt, uh, which I, I've, I would add that there is a, a, an interesting research done by the IMF on this point on what we could call the new lenders, which are not very transparent about what to whom and how much they are lending, and the integrity risks and democracy risks that they create. Um, and Hannah, uh, also, Perhaps continuing on, on, on this point of, of foreign influence, the New Zealand government has prepared actually guidance for public officials on how to identify when they are subject to what, what is called foreign interference attempts. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this guidance? I think um, uh, the audience here and the virtual audience would find it interesting and, and what good practice other governments can draw uh, for, for raising awareness for all public officials. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I, before I answer that directly that question, I would like to give a little bit of context of Card of New Zealand, and I'm, I'm loving these metaphors. I'm thinking about now the birds flying in formation into the sunlight. So um, <laughs> in, in New Zealand, we, um, in terms of this question of undue influence in the domestic policy process, I think we have a high level of confidence that, that there is not a significant issue. We have a high degree of transparency. Our ministers publish their diaries. It's routine for all submissions to any government policy process to be published, and the final advice is published, and submissions to parliament are published. So um, I think for us in a domestic setting, um, as I say, there's a high degree of confidence. There is one issue just to, to link to another um, topic that is the subject for this forum, which is really thinking about um, the potential unconscious bias in those systems and how that links to how we promote public participation um, in government processes. So this is something that we are emphasizing um, a need for our public service to be better at. And in order to do that, we are encouraging the use of, we have a policy community engagement tool and what that really does is ask government departments to be really explicit about the choices they're making about the degree of engagement in different settings. It's not always possible. There are other barriers, the political context, resource constraints. So really this tool is about being really upfront and honest about how much engagement and consultation is gonna happen. But within that tool, it does ask people to think about all of the stakeholders who may have an interest in that topic and to explicitly um, describe that. And so I think that has a really key role in addressing that unconscious bias and, and really considering those voices that may be excluded um, or who may be disproportionately listened compared to others. Um, so when you come to then the, the question of foreign influence in this context of relatively high trust, kind of confidence that our processes are working well. It's, um, it's almost a bit of a shift for, for our people to think about the threat that is there in terms of foreign interference. Um, I mean, we know that we need a comprehensive strategy, that the nature of these threats have changed considerably given geopolitical changes, given emerging digital technologies. And so the first step that we take is 
to be really clear about how we're organizing ourselves within government, establishing a leadership voice who can give guidance to others across government. And one of their key roles is to analyze those threats and to share information because we actually need to convince people that this is a real issue, that it's something to be taken seriously. And, and that's going to be essential if we're going to have people reporting suspicious information. Um, but then also to come to, to the guidance that you mentioned, what we can do in a proactive sense is to think about the um, protections that we can put in place. So what we have is a framework for protective security requirements that cover a whole range of different elements of security and they ask government agencies to work through that framework. It gives them a sense of what is um, really critical and that they need to have mandatory steps on but it also enables them to work through uh, in a flexible way that's appropriate to their organization and think about the maturity of how they might learn over time and to share experiences of what's good practice um, and to go and seek help from, from our system leader who um, gives them that advice and support. Thank, thanks very much, Hannah, for sharing this, I would say the other approach or a complementary approach in addition to transparency, the support that can be given to public servants and, and actually show that this is a real issue. Uh, more and more, we see it in more and more countries. Um, so Delia, the um, last question for, for the panelists, uh, perhaps bringing everything back uh, uh, to you. Uh, how can we uh, then ensure that we have more of the good influence and less of the bad influence, if we, if we can oversimplify it like this? And what can governments do, but also what can business do to engage and influence responsibly? Thank you very much, Julio. I promise to be very short because <laughs> we all want to, to go to have lunch. Uh, and uh, the message has been passed. Transparency International is 30 years old. 30 years ago, in a panel like this, nobody would have started by saying transparency is the answer. And transparency has two, is a coin of two sides. It's information, but it's also integrity. So thank you very much. We are in the right way, working together, civil society organization, governments, and the private sector. In this, there has been a long way. What we need really is action, not only commitments, not only signing declarations or, or even passing law. We have to transform these rules into reality, in the way in which business is conducted. So I ask everybody to work against the corruption cycle that I call she, steal, hide, enjoy. And we have to cut this cycle. And in this moment, we need governments to be very active, establishing beneficial ownership transparency. Central registers with update information and accessible to the public. We need governments to fight against enablers of corruption, those who help to hide the stolen money. And for this, the importance of strong democracies and the northern countries is quite, quite significant. The money that is uh, lost to corruption in Africa or in Latin America ends in the city of London, in the real estate in New York, in the luxury industry in France, or in the antiques and uh, art market in Geneva. And there are gatekeepers that are not doing the gatekeepers' jobs, but facilitating. In this sense, I wish that the Senate approved the Gatekeepers Act that is being discussed in US at this moment. But the problem we are facing now is the undue influence from new actors. It's not the business sector trying to hide what they are doing in terms of influence the government. It's the organized crime, 
the corrosive capitals, the foreign actors acting through what is called the influence industry. A colleague organization, Tactical Tech, has started collecting these companies that sell influence. We were aware of Cambridge Analytics because of the scandal, but there are lots of them working from outside, working for abroad, absolutely opaque. So they, uh, this organization is uh, or has created the Influence Industry Reporter, looking for this organization, saying where they are working, for whom they are working. And of course, these organizations will not go to any of the registers that we have created. For many years, we have developed together lots of tools, very important ones. We have to keep on uh, uh, renewing and updating them. But we have to start thinking for these new actors that will not register, that will not operate even from the country that are not foreign agencies, agents in the legal uh, term. And for that, we are facing two special problems. Domestic regulation is not enough to stop this uh, influence. For instance, if you, from X country, pay an influencer just to say something to, the, to his or her community and pay for that, in a campaign election, how is the regulation of a country tackle that? It's almost impossible. And also we have the, the, the speed of these messages going through. So these actors are not within the reach of domestic regulation. So the work of OECD is very important in this realm. You can collaborate in order to create the standards or help countries to coordinate the work, sharing information, for instance. The second point, how are we going to enforce these regulations? Even if we get the regulation from OECD or the standards, whatever it is, we have just published our report exporting corruption in order to measure how the OECD convention, convention anti, uh, against uh, foreign bribery. And I must say that the majority of the countries to the convention have a very weak activity enforcing the convention. And it is a very old, well-established convention. So we need regulation, but we also need multilateral collaboration for the enforcement not designed according to what we have now for MLA, the, the multilateral collaboration, which is uh, designed on the legal structure of the uh, 19th century. So the judge asks a question, goes to the foreign um, ministry to send that to the other country, the other country, to the judge, the judge that who, or the court that has to answer the question say, ah, there is a detailed meeting missing here, so we have to go back. In the meantime, money and influence is moving in our world at the velocity of a click in a computer or a click in our telephones. So we have to react to that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Delia, very much. Uh, for the last words, uh, um, before closing, I would, I would just like to give the floor uh, for a brief intervention from Gloria de la Fuente, uh, who's the chair of the OECD Working Party of Senior Public Integrity Officials. Uh, Gloria, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, because I... All of ours is so tired. I think it's so, so um, we are, we want to coffee. Okay. Yeah. That is okay. Well, I'm, my name is Gloria de la Fuente. I'm a, I'm a chair of the OECD Working Party of Senior Public Integrity Officials, SPO. 
And it's my pleasure to be here and today and listen of this interesting and your experience about this, this important situation. As chair of SPIO, and I want to share briefly of, an, of uh, how OECD is supporting democracies and strengthening political integrity and counter foreign, uh, foreign interference. As one mentioned early, uh, our working party is a responsibility to two of the main standards of this discusses, uh, discusses today. The OECD recommendation on public integrity and OECD recommendation on principles of for transparency and integrity lobbying. Both recommendations provide an essential foundation of the carrying out work on political integrity and in due foreign influence. On political integrity, the SPIO is commitment to supporting countries to raise standards on political integrity for elected and appointed officials. Through our country's review, we provide concrete recommendation based on good practices to address issues on lobbying conflict interest, the revolving door and the political finance. All of these things are, uh, you are talking about that. Uh, the take, uh, the work on political integrity furnished the SPIO will be organizing two expert groups, one of government officials responsible for oversight elements of for political integrity, ethics commissioners, political financial bodies, lobbying commissioner, etc., and one of like-minded elected and appointment officials uh, who are our commitment to strengthen integrity standards. An essential focus of these experts groups will be to develop guidance for government on strengthened political integrity. Concerning the issues for, of offering uh, offering interference, I am proud uh, of work of the SPO has done to date, in particular uh, through the 2021 monitoring report on the 20, 20, uh, 2010 lobbying recommendation, we highlighted that there is a very little uh, transparency of foreign government lobbying. Um, for finish, therefore, to the SPO is seeking to support OECD members to strengthen their frameworks or foreign, that of, on foreign influence. An essential tool is our visit uh, draft recommendation on transparency and integrity lobbying, which is now open for public consultation. That recommendation includes guidance for countries strengthening their transparency and integrity frameworks, not only non -domestic, on domestic lobbying and influence, but also on lobbying influence activities from foreign government and foreign commercial interest. The SPO is a, a full agenda ahead uh, of this, and, and we are confident this, this work, the OECD um, members and non-members reinforcing to democracy. Thanks for this space, uh, Julio, and thank you very much for uh, all of you. Thank you very much, Gloria. I mean, I have nothing to add. I think everything has been said by our speakers. Let me just thank you again. We have, we missed, uh, missing already two speakers. I had to catch a train, but um, join me please in, in thanking the speakers and a warm applause for you. Thank you very much, Julio, Gloria, and uh, the panelists for your insights on how to combat corruption, um, preserve integrity, and fight undue influence that are so key to uh, democracies. I'd like to um, end this morning's uh, sessions, plenary sessions, with one quote, uh, because I think we've addressed all these issues in the quote, and we will continue in the afternoon session. And the quote is by Abraham Lincoln, and is as follows. Democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I think we've addressed each bit of this uh, quote this morning and continue this afternoon. So I'm sure you're all striving for lunch. So I'm going to invite you to now go for lunch and move to the lunch break. 
the buffet is outside, as um, I told you this morning, and you're all invited. After lunch, we'll be meeting in smaller groups and parallel sessions, and the first uh, set of sessions, because we are so late, um, we'll uh, gather at 2.15, so we're 14, 15. We will meet in different rooms. Uh, the rooms are uh, notified outside on signposts. If you're lost, I'm sure somebody will be ready to accompany you and help you find your room. Uh, so don't hesitate to ask the staff members. So all I can say now is bon appetit and see you later. Thank you.